I'm going to talk for just a little bit about living and working in space. There's a lot to it. There's a lot of chemistry and physics and science, but there's also the crucial element of people and culture and people's attitudes and habits and what they like and dislike and their physical beings. What do people need to live on a place that isn't Earth? So we'll go through um, a little bit of that, and we'll start with the, with the picture you see here. Looking out the window in the International Space Station is one of the all-time top pastimes for astronauts and cosmonauts and taikonauts, people that travel in space. They never get tired of looking out the window at the Earth because it's home and it's endlessly fascinating and you get a sunrise or a sunset every 45 minutes. <laughs> so they spend a lot of their free time in this cupola on the ISS just looking at the world go by. I think I probably would too because that's a pretty compelling picture. So to get started, a little bit of a rewinding the Wayback Machine to the 1940s, late 1940s and early 1950s. The question of whether or not human beings could live in space became a real important question and a real question to answer once we were able to fly high enough and fast enough to think about actually getting outside the atmosphere. And so physiologists and chemists and scientists and engineers actually thought about whether or not human beings could live in a place that wasn't Earth, in a place that isn't our native environment. There were a couple things for them to consider. One of the most crucial ones was something we all take for granted every day and hardly ever think about. <laughs> gravity. Can a person live without gravity? Think of all the things that gravity does for us. Gravity keeps our bones dense and strong. Gravity keeps our muscles toned because we're always working against it to walk and lift for our hearts to pump fluids through our bodies. Every organ of our body depends upon gravity because it's got to push against that to stay strong. In a microgravity environment, scientists were worried that everything was going to go wrong. They worried that your heart might not work, your digestive system might not work, you might not be able to keep food or drink down, you might not even be able to swallow. They just weren't certain what was going to happen. Of course, instead of testing this on people right out of the box, mice were the first. See, two mice there. In 1952, aboard a, a little rocket called an Aero B, which you can see over in the next building, uh, scientists launched mice to see what would happen. Well, the mice became weightless and a little bit disoriented and confused, but their little tiny mouse hearts kept pumping and they lived. Their bodies could withstand not having gravity for a short period of time. Well, pretty soon there's a space race, right? The Soviets launched Laika, the very cute dog in the middle there, in 1957. Laika did not come back, but Laika lived. She survived the launch and being on orbit. Uh, her vital signs were monitored. Her circulatory system and her lungs did just fine. And so now a large mammal lived. Well, the, the, the spacecraft came back in but was unrecoverable, and so it burned up, and so did the puppy, unfortunately, yeah. There's a, there's a nice monument, if you Google Laika, you'll, you'll see a very nice monument to her, statue and everything. How do you spell that? L-A-I-K-A, -A. Laika. 1961, your United States Air Force physiologists helped launch a chimpanzee into space and recovered the chimpanzee named Ham 
and Ham got through it just great. His heart worked well, his lungs worked well, his, uh, uh, he was able to perform tasks and respond to lights and cues and so on. So he was able to live, think, and survive, even do some rudimentary work. Now Ham was unhappy when he came back <laughs> because he was upset because the spacecraft was hot and it was bobbing in the sea and he, he was mad. But they gave him a couple of oranges and he was good with it. Um, so he came through it okay. But all of this was to prove in the late 50s and early 60s that complex organisms, mammals, analogs of human beings, could survive microgravity and the launch and descent from space. So, it could be done. Soviets in 1961 sent up Yuri Gagarin, the first human being to travel in space. He made it through just fine and was a hero, and pretty soon the United States, very shortly thereafter, sent up one after another its Mercury astronauts. First suborbital, which means into space but right back down again, and then uh, Ohio's own John Glenn on an orbital mission all the way around the Earth before coming back. And they all did just great. They didn't die from microgravity. Then again, they were only there for a short time. They were only in space for a little while. It remained to be seen whether people could live or work long term in space, but especially working in space. That was a question because why do you want to go to space in the first place? What are you going to do when you get there? The reason to send people to space was to see what work they could do. Could you collect samples, for instance, from the moon and bring them back? Could you observe the Earth and comment on it? Could you solve problems in space? Could you work machines or even build them in space? Well, by the early 1960s and in the, the mid-60s, we were beginning to find out. The first American spacewalk took place in 1965. An Air Force officer, Ed White, stepped outside of the spacecraft, and believe me, that had to be one of the most amazingly, he probably didn't admit it, but the scariest, highest step ever to climb out of the spacecraft and be just out there. Well, he proved that he could be out there, pay attention, orient himself, move around, and actually perform the work of getting out and getting back. Later on, in the moon missions, one of which we're celebrating for the next couple of weeks, Apollo 15, the moon missions proved that not only could you survive in space, but you could go to another celestial body, land on it, figure out where you were, take care of yourself by eating, sleeping, drinking, and cleaning yourself, drive a lunar dune buggy around, pick up samples, set up experiments, observe and comment on the whole thing, and make it home safely. All of this was done by the middle 1970s. This is a very fast timeline from the end of World War II, people wondering, I wonder if you could survive in space, to 1972, yep, we can do that. We can survive on the moon and come back. We can make trips of 10 days or so. It's about longer though. What if you wanted to stay longer? What if you wanted to stay in Earth orbit for weeks or months or even a year? What would happen? Would, could you live through that? Well, let's find out. Staying healthy in space has been a question that physiologists and scientists have been trying to answer and getting better and better at for 50 years. What we've learned so far is that with proper uh, preparation, and paying attention to what the human body and the human psyche need, you can survive long term, maybe even indefinitely, in a microgravity environment. So 
let's look at some of the risks of long, long-term space flight. And by long-term, I mean months, maybe even a year. The top risk is radiation. The Earth and our atmosphere and the magnetic field surrounding the Earth protects all of us every day from radiation that would otherwise toast us like a s'more immediately. We're protected from this uh, to the extent that we can go outside in the sun for pretty long periods, but we're periodically reminded that we're susceptible to cosmic and solar radiation when we get a sunburn or um, if, if, uh, if your genetic makeup is such that you develop like a little melanoma or moles that need to be removed. So we're reminded of these things that radiation is a factor. Well, in space, without the atmosphere and the Earth's magnetic field to shield all that, solar and uh, cosmic radiation is just bombarding things like the International Space Station. What's the solution to this? Shielding on the space station, it's, it's got pretty good shielding, but those astronauts and cosmonauts get more radiation than we do. And they're monitored constantly and studied. Their physiology when they come back is studied very, very closely. Their, their fluids, their blood, their bones, their muscle, their brains, their nervous systems, all of those are studied to see what has happened. Some of the major risks of radiation are to your blood and bones and your nervous system. It could even contribute to heart disease in, in huge doses. And so it is not undangerous. It hasn't been solved yet because nothing can stop some of that radiation. Some of that cosmic radiation will cut through whole planets and there's nothing we can do to stop it but we may be able to learn more about it. And who knows, maybe in the future we'll solve that. Isolation is a problem. Um, imagine spending a year away from most of your family. Well, I, I bet a lot of you have uh, tried this in the last year or so. Staying away from everybody for long periods of time. Um, People tend to need the company of other people. So part of being isolated in space is actually kind of intuitively opposite. Imagine, okay, all of you right here are going to the ISS and you're all gonna live together for a year in a tube. Will you all be friends at the end? <laughs> Maybe, if effective teamwork and psychology are employed but you might get frustrated with one another and you might just get tired of seeing each other. Same people in the tube for a year. That is also part of isolation, being isolated from your normal environment in a small little place. That is something that um, space psychologists have endeavored to figure out. How do we keep people on an even keel, satisfied, being able to work, happy with one another, effective as a team? We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Distance from Earth is a problem. Just the raw distance. You can't go get a spare thing right now. <laughs> or, it's, or the people you want to see are on the other side of the planet for 45 minutes. Or you need a doctor. Or this part broken, you don't have another one. Just being away from Earth it causes potential problems. Your supply, your food is finite. Um, other supplies like air and water can be recycled, but inevitably you lose some. And so being away from the home planet, even though you're only up there in orbit just a little bit, you're still separate. You're, you're other, you're out there. And that is a factor in survival. Microgravity, as we've talked about, is, is a real danger. It does things long term to your bones and your muscles. Your bones get a little bit less dense and maybe even thinner. And your muscles tend to atrophy without proper exercise. And we'll talk about exercise. One of the, <coughs> excuse me, 
One of the main things that they do on the space station to combat the effects of microgravity is vigorous exercise. These people exercise two or more hours a day. And they've figured out ways to um, exercise in microgravity. So imagine a treadmill with giant rubber bands on it that fit over your shoulders like a harness, like the, the person on the upper right there. That thing is holding you down to the treadmill and simulating your own weight. So you can run on that treadmill just like you're on Earth, except it's, you've got this kind of weird, uncomfortable harness on you. But your muscles don't know any better, and so they think that you're lifting your own weight as you would on Earth. And so that's the way to keep your heart healthy, keep your muscles healthy, and keep your bones healthy. Constant, constant exercise. The closed environment, as I mentioned, is, is a risk because you don't have, you're not in such a big biosystem like the Earth that you can trade out all the oxygen, the water, the nutrients, and all that stuff with the rest of the planet. Your planet is now teeny tiny, and it's hard to manage a tiny mini micro world like that. You see the, uh, see the, the, the purple picture on the bottom there? Uh, that's an experiment called veggie. It actually is called veggie. They, they grew lettuce on, they grew their own lettuce and they, they ate it, it wasn't bad. But it grew in microgravity. Who knew that lettuce could grow in microgravity? So the lettuce didn't appear to care, but, uh, but they could grow it there. This is probably the first question most people think of when you say, do you want to go into space? The next thing they think of is, yeah, that would be cool, except how would you, yeah. Well, if you go over to look at the space shuttle exhibit, you'll see the space potty. And uh, long story short, the space potty is like sitting on a vacuum cleaner <laughs> because it literally is a vacuum. Uh, it has a, a suction that helps take all the waste away and that's critical because you don't want things floating about. That is not optimal. This happened in the Apollo program. Um, in the Apollo program, they didn't have a vacuum system. Um, they just had, a, you sort of had to do it yourself with the bag and so on. And they had what they called escapees. Oh, gosh. And yeah, so you don't want, and that's in this spacecraft behind us here. This little thing with you and two of your best friends for 10 days living in that closed environment. But on the space station and on the space shuttle, they have these magical vacuum space potties. And everybody has their own little fixtures. Um, uh, you don't, not everybody uses, yeah, you don't share those. You have your own personal ones. Um, but all the, the waste is vacuumed away. But there's other things to hygiene like, uh, taking a bath. Well, if you're going to spend any time on the International Space Station, say goodbye to showers and baths uh, because you're not going to be able to do that. What you're going to do instead is spread some liquid soap on yourself and then get a damp cloth and wipe it off. And to wash your hair, if you've got a haircut like mine, not such a big problem. But if you have long hair, you're going to have to use the, the rinseless shampoo that you sort of massage in there and then you comb it through and then you damp cloth it. But you can do this like straight up in the air like she is, like just, <laughs> it just stays there. So there's an advantage to microgravity if you have to use rinseless shampoo. Brushing your teeth in space is exactly like brushing your teeth like you did this morning, except you have to keep your mouth shut. So you get some water in there and you get your toothpaste on your toothbrush and you pop it in there and just creep them off while you're doing it because it's going to go everywhere if you don't. They're provided with uh, toothpaste that you're supposed to swallow or you can bring your own toothpaste if you want, if you don't mind swallowing your toothpaste because um, it's, it's possible. It's just like really super minty sometimes and it's, it's kind of gaggy a little bit. Now they... <laughs> At one time, there was, they tried a shower. In the Skylab program in 1973, 
they made this like cabana tube thing where you'd get in there and pull your cabana tube up and attach it at the top and then they had pressurized water and you could spray yourself all over with it but then you had to collect up all the water with the squeegee and vacuuming up and everything and it took more than two hours to take a shower and that was a big time waster and it was annoying and it just it didn't work very well and it was just weird so they stopped the whole shower thing and went back to the 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 bathing with with um with wet cloths thing eating and drinking okay so now you've done all your hygiene stuff it's really frustrating and you still probably kind of smell a little bit but now it's time to eat and drink well on the far right hand side there you'll see a wonderful appetizing tube of vegetables and beef yum yum that's from the apollo program and yep it was gross it was just pureed everything it was nasty but things have gotten a lot more pleasant over time they've paid a great deal of attention to making better food that's more appetizing and but yet suitable for eating in a spacecraft because having decent food is a huge part of your psychological well-being and so they've invented things like this that is not a taco friends that is a bacon cheeseburger it has a sliced up hamburger and some bacon and cheese whiz in a flour tortilla because you can't have a bun because it has crumbs but flour tortillas don't have crumbs so your bacon cheeseburger is kind of a bacon cheese whiz wrap in a tortilla but if you think hard enough it's a bacon cheeseburger they've even made pizzas on on the ISS you see that in the middle at the bottom uh, the astronauts were able to select their own toppings and everything for these pizzas that got packed away and then they heat them in the oven there on a, a on a shell that's not going to have crumbs and they can eat a pizza so they're for the most part pretty happy with the food however one thing that they don't have in space is a refrigerator there's an oven but there's no refrigerator because refrigerators are inefficient and heavy and big and so it's easier and more efficient just to pack the food very carefully in packaging that's not gonna degrade or rot or anything like that. Did you have a question? Oh, I did. Yes. Put, like, in the thing, uh huh. Does the food not float up? Well, it's kind of stuck together with the cheese whiz. Uh. <laughs> and so, so you stick it all together in cheese whiz and then fold it over. And then you have to you have to be a neat eater. No messy eaters in space because you know whatever whatever comes shooting out of the side of your mouth is going to go over here to your best friend get in the middle of their cheeseburger and they're probably not going to like that so so you have to be a careful eater plus you have to make sure you throw away all the packages immediately there's no leaving a mess in space you got to clean up everything the, the instant you do it so if you're if you're a messy eater and the, here's a tip for parents Go home and play like we're on the space station. Everybody clean up all the time right away, like you're in space. I, we'll see how far that gets you. But, but so eating can be complicated, but it's gotten way, way better over the last 50 years. So people get to choose what, what kind of foods they want and what form it's in. There was one person, uh, the Air Force's own Ellison Onizuka, who's in the upper uh, center there uh, tried using chopsticks in space I, I can't use chopsticks here so I don't know how well that worked but he gave it a whirl and uh, hopefully he got a good meal um, so food in space important and way better than it used to be sleeping okay you've worked all day you've done all your hygiene chores you've had a nice bacon cheese pita wrap thing and now it's time to go to sleep well the things we rely on to get to sleep well gravity is a big part of it because none of us sleep standing up and so your body expects you to recline 
it's used to that. But when you close your eyes and your inner ear doesn't have any signal that you're lying down, you might have problems being disoriented and not being able to go to sleep. This does happen sometimes, but the bottom line is that what you need most is this. And so they have these bags that they sleep in that make you comfy and cozy and you're kind of embraced by this thing. It keeps you from floating around during your sleep. Although some people hang their arms out of these things like the people on the bottom. And so you end up in this kind of horror movie position, this sort of neutral posture. But it keeps you from bumping around and ending up in unusual places and so on. And you can sleep in any configuration, upside down, right side up backwards, whatever it is, as long as you're attached to the wall or the floor or the ceiling, whichever it is you choose, you can fall asleep. A lot of these uh, astronauts use uh, like a, a, an eye mask because the lights never go off. They report that um, aside from getting used to not physically feeling like they're reclining, they sleep very well. They even dream. Some have had nightmares and some even snore. So in the end, it's not all that different. You just have to get used to hanging off the wall like a bat and having no feeling of up or down when your eyes are shut. You don't know what's up or down. It doesn't matter. Playtime. A big part of the psychological aspect of surviving long-term spaceflight is having some fun. They can't work, work, work all the time without a break. And so because we have these big powerful rockets now and a giant space station to go to, you can bring some toys and some musical instruments. And so when they get a break, you can play your saxophone in the cupola while you're watching your hometown go by 200 miles below you. You could bring your Superman underoos and go rocketing around. Yeah, and the, I mean, what better place to do the Superman thing than when you really can fly like Superman and a couple of other, they, they all had a costume to wear. So that was fun. These people also tend to play with their food. Who, who's not guilty of playing with their food sometimes, right? So, like I said, the, these astronauts tend to play with their food because it's really fun, like globules of water. And uh, if you go home and Google this later, Google pudding in space, you will see that pudding comes out of the container in really weird shapes. And it doesn't look like pudding you want to eat, but it's pudding, so it's pudding, so eat it. Uh, I think what they're playing with up there is guacamole. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's like a glob. It's not going to, you know, but if you catch it, you get all the guacamole. So they do play in space. They take simple toys like tops and tennis balls, and they've played badminton. They've even played soccer, and they tried to play basketball, but the ball just didn't come down. It, like, <laughs> kept going, so it was kind of didn't work. So they, they play but that's necessary. It is necessary to maintain a proper attitude. Of course, they have to work too. Their work day begins at about six o'clock in the morning and goes past nine o'clock at night with breaks for exercise and eating and so on, but they work an awful lot and fun. Yes, and some fun. Uh, the jobs that these people do indoors are all science jobs. It's all about engineering, physics, physiology, medicine, manufacturing, all of the above. And everything that they do is built on the idea that what experiments are most useful in microgravity? What can you do or make or find out in the absence of gravity? You can make really interesting things. Yes? As far as I know, they're always told what to do. Um, there are experiments that have flown on space shuttles that like students have designed. Like they wanted to, to know like um, what happens to bird eggs 
you know, a bird egg sits in a nest with gravity, but what about a bird egg with no gravity and things like that. And so they, uh, but I, as far as I know, uh, all of these astronauts have performed experiments that other people have devised. Some of them simple, others really complex, and in a lot of cases, the astronauts themselves are the science project. Um, their bodies, their blood, their organs, their muscles, their nervous systems, their eyesight, all of these things they study. And so that a lot of times they're doing tests on themselves. They draw blood all the time from each other and test it and so on. And so the, you can see that this scenery inside the space station, it's not like science fiction, clean kind of Ikea, nothing's there, it's just this clean thing. So it's, it's an environment that's just full of stuff and you have to know what it all is and what it all does and where it all goes. That's why there's so much training involved. They work outdoors as well. Not as often, of course, but they do have to fix the space station. Sometimes batteries need changed or things malfunction outside and a part needs adjusted or fixed or moved or whatever it is. And working um, on orbit outside the space station is a delicate and extremely well choreographed enterprise. Every step of everything they do is planned and managed and inspected, viewed, and choreographed by someone else on Earth who's watching the whole thing. So they'll tell them, go over here five feet, take out tool A, go over here, put it in the slot, give it half a turn, now back away, your partner's going to do something else, now go back up and do it again. All of this is told to them so they never miss a step. It's all about checklists and training and so on. To get out there, they don't just hop in the spacesuit and go. They have to start pre-breathing pure oxygen uh, a little more than two hours before going outside. And the reason that they're going to pre-breathe pure oxygen is to avoid what's called the bends. The inside of the spacesuit is at a very low atmospheric pressure just above the amount of pressure needed to keep you alive with pure oxygen. It's a delicate sort of science equation about how much oxygen you need to live, but long story short, what we're breathing right now is pressing down on us at about 14.7 pounds per square inch. And of that, of all that weight, only 20% of it is oxygen. So if you took away everything else, 20% of 14.7 is the minimum pressure of oxygen that you need to live. And that's what's in a spacesuit. The reason they do that in a spacesuit is because if you blew it up with 14.7 pounds, it would be really hard to move your arms and legs. It would be like weightlifting all the time. So the lower the pressure in the spacesuit, the easier it is to work and move your fingers and digits and arms and legs. So spacesuit is low pressure, pure oxygen, but you have to do special breathing before you get there. You also have to do the reverse when you come back to a normal atmosphere. So what's a typical day like on the ISS? I've got a list here. I'll go through it quickly, but you'll see that these, these folks have a real busy, busy day. Where's my list? Here it is. Okay. Six o'clock. Breakfast, personal hygiene, and house cleaning. You've, you've eaten, you've cleaned up, brushed your teeth, maybe kind of washed your hair. After that, everybody has a meeting with each other to talk about the daily schedule. Immediately following that, blood samples, because everybody's an experiment. Then a daily conference with mission control on the ground to see what the station needs and what updates they have for you. Next, an air quality check. The air inside the space station is crucially important. If somebody smells something different, smoke or chemically smell, that is cause for concern. And so they'll, they'll do this air quality check and make sure everything's okay. 
After that, it's treadmill and exercise bike, jogging around for about two hours with your, with your big rubber bands on you. After that, the entire crew meets for lunch. It's important that they all get together for meals because that's an important part of team building and like trust and friendship and they have some fun while they're eating. But instead of everybody deciding where and when they're gonna have lunch, it all takes place at once in the same spot. Then a one hour break. Okay, you've eaten lunch, you've planned the day, you've exercised and now you have a break. What are you gonna do with your break time? You're gonna play. Maybe go play your saxophone in the cupola, or you know, play netball or foosball or play with the toys. It's an important thing. So take a break for one hour. Then it's routine maintenance. Change the filters. Make sure this is turned on. Make sure the light bulb works. Make sure it's all in tip-top shape. Then there's an air pressure check. An air pressure check is important because. Uh, you, you may remember, uh, this had to be two or three years ago, there was a leak in the ISS. The air pressure was going down and they couldn't figure out where and they couldn't stop it until somebody found that somebody had drilled a hole. I don't know if they ever found out if it was sabotage or an accident or manufacturing problem or what, but there was a hole. And that's a serious thing. So air pressure checks all the time. I got a question. Is yes, sir. In the ISS all the time? Yes, sir. Yep. Even when they when they change out, right. yeah, there's always there's always somebody in there. And um, there have been as few as I think three people in there. But those three were really busy to to keep up all that stuff. So there's there's normally more than that, but there's always somebody in there. Yes, that's a good question. Um, the afternoon, after you do all this, it's all about the experiments. You're going to go do your science experiments all afternoon. Then you clean your experiments and check the systems. Yes? I was asking, how many people can the ISS accommodate maximum? I think the maximum number is right about there. I think that's about 10 people, 10 or 11 people. And so it's, it's got enough room for, now I'm sure all those, all those people, that, that looks kind of like a crowd, um, but it can accommodate uh, that many people, yes? And also does the International Space Station accept like basically astronauts from any nation? Yes, right, that's um, the, the international aspect of it means that they have astronauts both from NASA, from the Russian uh, space program, um, from the ESA, the European Space Agency, and then lots of guests from all sorts of other places. There have been like Saudi astronauts, Taiwan, Chinese, I mean, from, from all British astronauts. In fact, um, I think a, a British astronaut, Chris Hadfield, is, has made a name for himself because he did a recording of David Bowie's uh, Major Tom in the cupola with a guitar. You can find this on YouTube. It, it went viral really quickly. So uh, Google it for yourself, uh, Hadfield Bowie Major Tom Space Station, and you'll see an international astronaut uh, doing a great song. So they, they do all their experiments, they clean everything up, then it's more free time, and then dinner all together, and then sleepy time. After all that, you're gonna to wanna to go zip your cell phone to a wall and go to sleep for a couple hours, because that is a rigorous schedule. Yes, ma'am. Um, who makes the decision, so what is the criteria for who is on the space station? It's a good question. Who decides who gets to go to the space station? Those are the decisions of the individual space agencies, and um, the qualifications to become an astronaut are, they used to be that you had to be a man, five foot 11 or under, 4,000 or so hours as a military test pilot, et cetera, et cetera. No longer. Um, th that was like Mercury, Gemini, Apollo era. Now, astronauts um, of any gender, of any height, but your qualifications are expertise in some area of something you're going to do up there. And 
appropriate health to withstand the journey. And the stick to for lack of a better word, to undergo all the training involved. It's a big commitment to do all that training. But you know, if you're if you're a scientist or an engineer of some sort and you're healthy and you want to go to space, you can apply to do this. And if you're accepted, you have a long road of training ahead of you, but it can be done. Yes. So how do they decide which space agencies get what number of astronauts? You know, that's a good question. The, the question is, how do they decide among the different space agencies who gets how many slots? Uh, you know, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Um, we know that for the, for the greatest part, the funding comes from NASA and from the Russians. Uh, for the longest time, the only way to get there and back was Russian spacecraft. And the design of those Russian spacecraft, uh, by the way, never changed. So if you're a tall American astronaut, you're going to be crammed into a 1960s design Russian spacecraft and you're going to be uncomfortable for a little bit going up and down because they didn't make them any bigger. They're still, they're still small. Um, but that, that's a good, we should all go home and figure that out. Who gets to decide how many places who gets um, for these things? So there they all are on the ISS and well, we're already into to question mode. So um, that's it. At, yeah, oh, Ken, did you have a question? We have a question on Facebook. Oh, okay. Facebook oh, question. Mess up their name. Sir Hawk says, I heard a spider made, made a web in space. I, he heard, that? I heard that too. I don't know the details, but I do know that there was a spider and the spider completed a web. <laughs> but I don't know when and I don't know who found it. But I think it is true. I'm pretty sure it's true. Yes, spider experiments, the Charlotte's Web portion of the <laughs> days, the day's events. Yes. Uh, yeah, there are. Uh, the question is about bugs and animals. There are uh, bug and animal experiments um, frequently. Oh, uh, oh, no, they're, they're very, very closely contained and monitored. Um, what is, the only thing that's impossible to contain is the human funkiness of the space station. It frankly smells bad. It's, and, and newcomers to the space, space station usually comment on, like, their first minute there, they're wow, man, you people stink. But it is impossible to not. It, it smells lived in, as they say, um, but that's just because it's a closed mini micro world full of humans. And despite all of our best attempts to clean everything, we're still messy biological beings. So try as we might, we're still gonna smell if we can't like have a, a real water bath all the time that we want. So, other questions? Yes. Uh, another one on Facebook, Mr. Uh -huh. Jennings asked, how is the path of the ISS established, the flight path, orbiting path? Oh, um, well, it's established um, from the ground. It's not, it's not quickly variable, but um, it's established um, in an orbit that that gives a 45 minute rotation and uh, beyond that its station keeping is all managed from the ground so it's um, they don't want like a hugely elliptical orbit because they are conducting experiments the whole time so a stable round orbit is best for that sort of activity and best for not stressing the structure of the station too. Thank you. So. Other questions? Yes. So, do you think there are going to be any major adjustments from the way that they were on the ISS? Like, if there are, like, large colonies, like, the way that they have to deal with all the other stuff? Great question. So, we're looking forward. How is a Mars trip going to change? 
how's it going to be different from the ISS? Well, a couple things will change. First of all, you're going to have super long duration space flight because the first people going to Mars probably aren't coming back. It's probably going to be a one-way trip. We don't know when, we don't know how they're exactly going to get there, but uh, the duration will, will, will be forever and the distance from Earth will be ever greater. So the necessity of really good medications, optimal health, and some expertise aboard like a surgeon or a doctor, that's going to become paramount because health will be complicated by distance. You won't be able to always call home quickly. So that'll change. Because it's a closed environment, food will be finite. So how are we going to grow things? Are we going to grow things? What are we going to grow? How's that going to work? There's a lot of complicated problems to figure out before we get to Mars. And before we establish a permanent presence there, we're really going to have to figure out whether us, these little biological human things, are really suited to living on a world that isn't our native one. Can we do it? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I have great hopes that we can figure it out because we figured it out up to now, but there's so much to figure out that we need, you know, every smart kid in this whole building who's interested in this space stuff to apply themselves to that issue of how can human beings make our own world suitable for us or keep it suitable? And then that other question, can we live on other worlds? Maybe. Let's give it a shot.